Good evening, people. Hi, this is Dr. Parijat Kumar. I'm the current co-founder of International Sports and Orthopedic Manual Therapy. I'm from a different setting, guys. So I welcome you all to ISOM's free live lecture on advanced osteopathic and manual therapy techniques in postural imbalances in office-going workers. I know you might be having a lot of uh, people uh, white collar job people or corporate people who might be coming to you for their neck pains, back pains, thoracic pains, and many more. So this presentation or this free live lecture can really help you to help and treat and manage your patients with neck pain or back pain, especially when they're in a sitting sedentary job. Okay. Uh, now try to understand this is a free live lecture. Okay. So I can I'm going to show you, demonstrate you the some techniques, some uh, muscle energy osteopathic techniques, and some manipulation techniques on my subject over here. Okay. Uh, happy Sunday to one and all. Uh, good evening. Namaste. Salam alaikum. I welcome you all. Okay. And uh, there will be a, a quiz shared after the lecture, and people who are waiting for the certificates. Uh, and who score five out of 10 successfully will get their certificates. Uh, if you have any questions and concerns, I will share you the contact details of our organization and we can go from there, all right? So I should keep going. Advanced manual therapy and osteopathic techniques in postural imbalances in office desktop workers, okay? Now I'm not going to uh, tell you a lot of ergonomic advices because yes, ergonomic advices do help, but how, as a manual therapist, I can help my patients, uh, that I'm going to discuss, okay? And guys, uh, I know my voice might be a little echoing uh, because I'm in, at a new setting, so just bear with me, okay? All right, so the content shown is, is uh, just a quick uh, update that it's a legal copyright of our company, which is ISOM Foundation, so, and the contact details, uh, we have a website, uh, many people know. You can uh, look up to the courses uh, that you want to learn more from us. You can see our website, the isom.com. We have a lot of courses on there. We have memberships. And if you have any questions and concerns, you can WhatsApp us to the mention number over there. All right, I'll get started. Okay, guys, I want to talk to you guys. Uh, let me see. Uh, wait, I want you all to message me or uh, mention that in the chat box. What is a good posture according to you? What is a good posture according to you? Tell me in the chat box, guys. Let's make it an interactive session. What is a good posture? Tell me in the chat box. I want you to mention that in the chat box. What is a good posture, guys? You can mention in the chat box. Somebody saying laying down. <laughs> Somebody saying comfortable position. Now, what do you mean by comfortable position? I like some of my previous uh, fellow people. They are answering is answering this correctly. Good portion. Body that device. Absolutely, good portion is providing minimal force and maximum potential. That's a good answer. Good answer, guys. Good answer means good alignment and balance. Good. Uh, sitting straight is not a good posture. That's why I'm here to clear your myths that when you say, oh, sit straight, well, try. You cannot sit, sit straight practically for more than maybe 30 seconds, two minutes or five minutes. You try doing that. And you can't sit straight for more than five minutes. Practically not possible. So let's talk practical things to our patients and recommend some practical things to our fellow uh, members and patients, okay? Minimal effort by the muscles. Sitting in an erect posture and straight is actually not a good posture. You cannot, uh, yes, it helps with the breathing. It helps with the cardiopulmonary functions, but sitting straight and erect posture is practically not possible because of the endurance of the muscles. Your back muscles, 
which are working all the time eccentrically, they cannot hold your body weight or the trunk weight like at least for more than like two minutes. Okay. So I'll tell you, and yes, many people are right, like a good portion is the one where the alignment is good and the potential is maximum efficient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you my definition. Good answers, guys. Good answers. Good balance and correct alignment. Now, when you say about the alignment, when if you ask any of your patient, sir, that you have been working on a desktop for more than two hours or one hour, believe me, they will go in a faulty alignment. So you cannot prescribe a good alignment to your subjects or your patients while they are working. If I tell my patients, what is a good alignment? Okay, sitting straight is a good alignment. Putting your elbows like this is a good alignment. Believe me, they will change their posture in like every 30 seconds, every 45 seconds. When you say good balance, patients will not be able to sit in a good balance, sitting straight or correct alignment for more than 30 seconds or one minute or maximum two minutes. They will have to change their positions. And all the posture changes are happening because they have to focus on their work. I cannot be taking lecture straight like this. I have to slouch in between. Okay, I can lean back. I can cross my legs. So you cannot sit in one posture for more than 30 seconds. Believe me. All right. So I'll, according to me, if you can hear me, you can very well uh, contradict me. But according to me, a good posture is your next posture. I can write that down for you all. A good posture, what I tell my patients, is your next posture. Good posture is your next posture. Because no matter what position you are in, now if you're sitting straight, you try sitting straight for five minutes. Believe me, your back will go into spasm. Your lower back can get tired because your muscles are not ready for that endurance exercise. It's a kind of endurance exercise for the lower back. I can't be sitting straight in the lecture uh, taking this lecture, I will like slouch. So if you can see, I'm sitting straight. Okay. So I'll show you like that. Okay. So if you tell me, okay, so let's sit straight. So I'm sitting straight like this. I can't take the lecture like this for more than two minutes. I will slouch. I will slouch like this. I can't be sitting like this for like more than two minutes or five minutes. I can't be doing my work for five minutes, 10 minutes like this sitting straight. I have to slouch like that. You see that? I have to slouch like that. I can't be doing that. Or I have to recline. I have to recline or I can move forward. So I can't be sitting straight for more than two or three minutes. So I tell my patients that your good posture is your next posture. And how frequent you should, you should be changing your posture is actually every 60 minutes. There are certain European guidelines. Uh, Dr. Kanisha Pandey is one of our UK experts. She's an ergonomic specialist. Uh, she has taken a free live lecture a long time back where she has discussed about the, the good posture is actually your next posture. What is the next posture? I tell my patient that every 60 minutes, you might you will have to change your posture. And it, it's not like change your posture. It's like break your posture. So say, for example, if I'm taking and my eyes are on the laptop right now, I'm sitting, I'm taking this lecture. Every one hour, practically, I tell my patients to just take your eyes off the screen. You can rotate your neck. That's it. Or you can lean back or you can move forward. You can cross your legs. If you have a call, you will just stand up and take your call. You want to go for like your restroom. Like you cannot go to restroom every hour. <laughs> uh, you can't be drinking water every hour. You have to complete your projects and your work at your desk. So just change or you break your posture. Break your posture and the eye contact from the screen every 60 minutes, okay? Now, the European guideline says that you have to break it for at least 30 seconds. Now, 30 seconds is also not practically possible. So every 60 minutes, you break the posture for 30 seconds. So if I'm sitting straight for 60 minutes, I can break the posture and be in that posture for like 30 seconds. Now, practically not possible because the person will have to do their work, okay? So if I'm sitting straight, I just turn around, I just turn around, I can stretch a little bit, okay? And that's it. That's the break of the posture. And I come back every 60 minutes, okay? And what I do many times, uh, sorry for that shake. My table is a little wobbly. <laughs> uh, and uh, what I do 
a little trick you can tell your patients is when they're working on the laptop, I put a cross, I put a cross on their dorsum of the hand. So if they're working like this and I tell them that whenever you see this cross on your hand, you can take a marker, you can take a sticky note, you can take small sticky things and you can sometimes say that you can put it on your dorsum of the hand and uh, tell them that whenever you're working and if your eyes go on that, if your eyes go on that, break your portion. So I'm working like this. My eyes are constantly on the screen and I'm working for like 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes. And in between, I can look at the laptop or my keyboard and my eyes can go on the dorsum of the hand. And if I see that sticky note or a marker or a small thing, or maybe at a tattoo or something, uh, I need to break my posture. So that's like a good feedback to your patients uh, where they get a reminder or a recall or an alarm that they need to break the posture. Okay. So my definition of good posture is your next posture. All right. I can move forward. Now, let me ask you again. Now, we know that the muscles can be tight. You can have forward head posture. You can have hamstring tightness. You can have trapezius tightness. You keep on telling them to stretch the muscles. Uh, do you think that will really help with the posture? Uh, should we only treat the muscle imbalances like your uh, neck muscles are weak? Your suboccipitals are tight. Uh, your pecs can be weak. Your rhomboids can be weak. Uh, we all keep on doing the upper trapezius stretch. I mean, do you think that will really help with the posture or what are your thoughts on that? Or should we like really kind of see some joint dysfunctions too? When a patient comes to you with a neck pain, middle back pain, thoracic pain, shoulder blade pains or low back pain. Do you think we should just kind of focus on the muscle? Because I understand, guys, we are trained to be a soft tissue specialist. What we like to do is, OK, soft tissue tight. Let's stretch it. Let's heat it up. Let's provide some modalities. Uh, let's uh, do some kind of a, a soft tissue treatment like cupping, needling, taping, uh, massages, myofascial. Do you think that is the only thing that will help the patients? Short term, symptomatic? Yes, it will. Uh, placebo? Definitely it will. Well, if you warm my muscles over here and you massage my muscles over here, obviously it will be uh, comfortable. I want you all to do one thing right now. I want you all to be sit, uh, come in a sitting position. I want you all to come in a sitting position right now. If you are laying down, so please come in a sitting position and try to palpate your upper trapezius or your levator scapulae, which is just around your superior angle of the scapula. So try to feel for your trapezius. Try to feel for your trapezius. And believe me, my left trapezius is also kind of a tense. My trapezius, upper trapezius, or the levator scapula is also tense. But I don't have any neck pain. So how can you say that upper trapezius tightness is leading to that patient's neck pain? So the long story short, we should be assessing the joint dysfunctions too, along with the muscles imbalances. Because there is something called arthrogenic inhibitions. The, the joint dysfunction or the joint malalignment can cause the muscles to work in an improper manner, okay? So yes, you can treat the muscles as well. Not that I'm saying that you can't treat the muscles and that will not help the patients. You need to strengthen the primary agonist. That's very important. You can stretch the muscles. You can provide soft tissue treatment. I'm not against that, but you need to see the joint dysfunction as well, okay? So that is my thought on the joint dysfunction. And these are the areas which is commonly affected it's like a universal pattern on your slide that you see. Uh, so muscles that you see, maybe the suboccipitals are tight, the deep neck flexors are weak, upper trapezius can be tight as well as the weak. Okay, levator scapula is tight a lot of times. That's why patients complain of like a scapular thing, pain. Uh, rhomboids are hypertonic a lot of time. Your wrist and forearm extensors can be hypertonic. That's why patients can complain of the tennis elbow or the lateral epicondylopathy. Pecs can be tight. I'm working like this all the time protracted shoulders, okay? Erectus spiny, levator costarum on the back of the muscles. or the uh, It can be tight because it's working eccentrically all the time to work. Your abdominals or your obliques, they can be weak as well as tight. So please, guys, focus on the obliques when you are training uh, the patient, especially with the neck pain, thoracic pain, or the back pain. G-max can be weak. 
hamstrings can be tight, quads can be weak as well as tight. Okay, I sound like I'm reciting a poem. <laughs> your calf, your calf muscles can be weak as well as tight. Okay, intrinsic foot muscles can be weak because you're sitting all the time of the day. Okay, how somebody is asking me how obliques can affect neck pain? Absolutely, that's a great question. Regional interdependence. We teach a lot of regional interdependence at the ISOM platform. We teach hands-on training, which we teach online courses. And that's what we teach at the ISOM platform that if I treat my patients regional interdependent area, say for example, oblique, it can fix my patient's thoracic posture, thoracic kyphosis, and it can help the patient with the neck pain. You think thoracic kyphosis or increase of the slouch posture is all because of the weakness of the upper back muscles? No. I can be sitting, uh, I'll show you. I can, excuse me. I can be standing, I can be standing in a posture like this. Okay, you can see, I can be standing in a posture like this. I can be standing in a posture like this. So if my abdominals are not strong enough, the pelvis will not be supported. The thoracic spine will not be supported. So I can be standing like this. Okay, I can show you from the front. Okay, I can be standing like this. So you have to straighten it up. When you are saying that you have to straighten it up, you have to work on these obliques to help your rib cage flare out properly so that your thoracic spine can come in a proper alignment. And if your thoracic spine come in a proper alignment, your hips are in a proper alignment, your shoulders come in a proper alignment, and that will help you with your patients with the neck pain. That is called regional interdependence, okay? So when you're working with your neck pain or a low back pain, it's not just the one area that you have to treat. The regional interdependence says that you have to see the entire body the neck pain can be coming because of the thoracic, can be coming from the lumbar, can be coming from the weak abs and the obliques, or can be coming from the hips, even the lower extremities, okay? So just don't uh, treat or assess the postural muscles. That's what I said in my previous slide, that you have to see the joint dysfunction as well, guys. Oops, too fast. So that's what I asked you. That's what I asked you that don't just treat the joint uh, muscle imbalances. Muscle imbalances, you and me right now, we all are having, okay? Your upper trapezius is tight, my upper trapezius is tight, my neck flexors are weak, your neck flexors are weak, my hamstrings are tight, your hamstrings are tight. Do you have pain? Do I have pain? I don't think so. So you need to work on the joint dysfunction as well because these muscle imbalances can be universal, okay? The joints, that is commonly affected is C not C3. Okay. Now, if you tell me that, okay, the patients are having a forward head posture, what are you going to do about it? You train the muscles. Well, do you think if the patient is in a forward head posture and you tell them the chin tucks, do you think their forward head posture is going to get corrected in like two days or two weeks? Tell me in the chat box, guys. Tell me in the chat box. If you work on the patient's forward head posture and you tell them to do chin tucks, maybe twice a day for two weeks, do you think the forward head is going to get corrected? It needs time, absolutely. And do you think that the patient is compliant to your exercise? Do you think that the patient is not going back to the same posture? They will. They will not listen to you, believe me. Patients will come and go according to their convenience. They will do exercise according to their convenience. They will maintain their postures according to their convenience and their work. So. No matter how you tell your patients uh, that do this chin turns, do this exercise, patients are not going to listen to you. Understand that. So you have to recommend them something simple and practical. I repeat, you have to recommend them something simple and practical. What is simple and practical? Just change your posture every 60 minutes or break your posture every 60 minutes, okay? Your cervical thoracic region is, is one of the areas that I would be demonstrating the technique that can be affected quite a bit. And your shoulder problems, patients with the upper back problems or the neck problems, it can be affected. Your thoracic spine gets stiff. You're constantly working over there. It gets stiff. Your ribs get affected. I'm constantly in an elevated position. So my upper ribs get affected. Lumbosacral gets affected. Understand that. Lumbosacral gets affected because I'm in that sitting posture. So I have some of the self-mobilization and self-sitting distraction that I will teach you today 
in my this free live lecture so that you can tell your patients to do that when they are sitting at their workstations. Okay. We have hip joint as well and your superior radiola joint as well that can help your patients who are having a lateral elbow pain. Okay. All right. What we are treating. So that's why I tell my uh, colleagues in my online courses and my hands-on training that don't just treat the soft tissue. Don't just treat the soft tissue. You have to treat the asymmetry. You have to treat the restriction of motion. Okay. Oops. What are the causes? Obviously, the sustained posture, not just their desktop. It can be a sleeping position. It could be driving. People are driving from their home these days to their work. Uh, well, some companies are not anymore telling them to work from home. They want the employees to come. So <laughs> they can be uh, driving long hours. They can have a problem. It could be a repetitive micro trauma or a one time trauma where I can just turn around if my chair is not a swivel chair. So if something, say, for example, my colleague or my boss calls me from behind and I'm doing my work. And if my boss calls me from behind and if my chair does not swivel. So what do I do? <coughs> Excuse me. I turn, turn like that. I turn like that. So that is an abrupt turn and it can cause a back pain. Okay immobilization or any resolution of pathology disease say for example i just i just recovered from covid any viral fever that causes an inflammation in my body and that can cause pain in your back so you need to assess the root cause okay there is a osteopathic muscle energy technique that i would like to show you now uh, where you can perform this technique if your patient comes especially with the headaches or upper cervical neck pain, okay? So this is called a suboccipital technique. If you see my fingers over there, it, it's cupped under the occipital condyles, okay? It is cupped under the occipital condyles and I ask my subject or my patient to perform a gentle nodding. Gentle nodding, it's not a chin tuck, guys. It's a gentle nodding, okay? If you remember C0, C1 muscle uh, joint function, it is a simple nodding like this. That's it. It's a simple nodding. It's not a chin tuck. So your C0, C1 performs this function, gentle nodding. Okay. So that's what I'm going to ask my patient or my subject to perform. And what I'm doing with my cupping hands, I'm trying to provide a little bit of a distraction force at that C0, C1 capsules because capsules get tight. Patient holds that for like five to 10 seconds and relax and I further distract the C0-C1 joint. How this technique is performed, I will show it to you. Uh, patients can perform this technique at the home using a towel roll under the occipital condyles as well, okay? So I will show you the technique, is the only time. On my subject over here, okay? So if you see, let me adjust the camera a little bit. To see what are the all right so i will show you these two techniques uh and i'm going to stop my share screen and so that you can guys can see a little bit more on the bigger screen okay i guess that's a good view so what i'm going to do over here so my Subject is in a comfortable laying down position. Okay. I'm going to palpate her occipital condyle over here. If you see, I'm going to palpate her occipital condyle. Okay. Her occipital condyle over here. And I'm going to take my hand like a cupping motion and I'm going to palpate like this. Please relax now. Please relax. Okay. So I'm going to cup her, cup her occipital condyles like that. I'm gonna provide a gentle distraction like this. You see this gentle movement, guys. I'll bring the laptop a little closer so that you can see the movement. Take my thumb off. See the gentle distraction. See the gentle distraction. Very gentle, it has to be very gentle, okay? Now I want my patient to perform a gentle nod. The nod, I can guide her. The nod should be like this. That's it. The nod should be like this. That's it. That's called the nod. Okay. 
So let me perform the suboccipital stretch. That's it. And I want you to perform a little nod, ma'am, for me. Thank you. On that, keep breathing, keep breathing. Now, if you want a little bit more precise, I can ask my patient to open the mouth a little bit. That's a comfortable position for the T and J, all right? So I'm going to distract it a little bit, open the mouth a little bit and perform me a nod, please. Nod would be like this, ma'am. You're pushing your head back. Nod would be like this. So don't push your head back. Okay, relax. Now perform me a nod. That's good. That's good. Hold there. Hold there. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. Hold it there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Relax. Any problem? Good. Now the patient might not feel too much on this, okay? Because I'm going very gentle. I need to stretch the capsules of the C not C1 over here. This muscle energy technique works great, guys, especially when you have a patient with a headaches. Okay. So I'm going to demonstrate this again. So perform it, distract the suboccipital condyles. Hold it over there. And I ask her to perform a slight nod. That's it. Good. Hold it there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. There we go. You can perform this five times if the patient's uh, symptoms are severe. You can perform this 10 times if the patient's symptoms are moderate. I like to perform it somewhere from three repetitions to five repetitions initially, or I can increase it to maybe 10 repetitions, okay? Once a day, patients can put a towel roll under the occipital condyle. It gives a self-distraction to the suboccipital and they can perform a gentle nod with the mouth open. Why mouth open? Because it helps to relax your sternocleidomastoid. I repeat, mouth open because it helps to relax your sternocleidomastoid right over there. So please remember, we are not doing the chin tucks like this. We are not doing this. We are gently doing a little nod. That's it. Nod. That's your C not C1. All right. That is one of the techniques that I like to show for the suboccipital because patients' suboccipital muscles can be tense because they're constantly in that forward head posture. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to show you a technique for it's a generalized technique for your erectus spiny. Okay. So please can you sit up facing that way, ma'am? All right. So the so the patient is sitting in a comfortable position. Okay. Now, always, guys, respect your patient's gender and age. Okay. I'm not going to ask her. I would request her. Can you lift your shirt up a little bit, ma'am, if you don't mind? Thank you. So we can help you roll. Now, say for example, if she's a patient with a back pain. If she's a patient with a back pain or middle pain, I would like to demonstrate this technique, okay, in a sitting position, okay? She's sitting comfortably. And what I would like to do is, she's sitting comfortably in a chair, and I would like to ask her to bend forward slowly with the hands in between. Bend forward and hold it there, hold it there. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to provide her a little bit of a, myofascial, a little bit of a myofascial on that lumbosacral area and one hand on the top, okay? And I'm going to ask her to gently push yourself back on my hand, on the upper hand. Gently, gently. One, two, three, four, five, six, relax. And I, no, and I passively uh, bring her into a little bit more flexion. So I'm pushing on my upper hand on the thoracic section, and I'm pushing her down simultaneously as well, okay? This is for the spine, okay? You can work segmentally, you can work on the lumbar spine, you can work on the thoracic spine by placing, by weighting your hand, okay? So I'm just demonstrating you a general technique, okay? So can you please bend forward my hand? All right, now push onto my hand back. I resist that, I resist that. I am resisting the technique, I'm resisting her extension and relax. And I further reinforce her in flexion. Can you push back? Push back, push back. I'm resisting her thoracic lumbar extension for four or five counts. And then she relaxes. And then I further push her forward. Don't push the patient too much forward. Okay? And take it easy when you're doing the muscle energy technique because it is just like a, a 
two to five pounds of force. You should not be using more than force of two kilos or three kilos. Very gentle force, very gentle stress, a gentle pressure when you do it in the forward flexion. So please make sure to perform these techniques with very gentle pressure. A good manual therapist is a person who performs all the techniques with very gentle pressure. All right. So these are the two osteopathic techniques that I would like to show you guys. Okay. I this lecture will be on uh, the different social media, so you can kind of uh, uh, access uh, our membership of the ISOM, and we can give you the recordings of that. Okay. And I need to kind of move forward, guys. I will show you this technique again. So here it is. So this is the technique I was showing you, okay? So you can perform this like five repetitions or 10 repetitions. It is causing segmental flexion, segmental flexion, all right? It is called causing segmental flexion over there, okay? All right. Coming on to the high velocity, low amplitude thrust, which everybody wants to do. We want to be the chiropractor, guys. <laughs> please don't do that. Before you do the any kind of a manipulations, please make sure that your patients are not falling under any category of contraindication. Okay. What are the contraindications? These are the contraindications which you need to be very, very clear. Okay. The patient should not be having too much of pain. That is a contraindication. If you're not sure, what is the diagnosis? I was telling people the number one absolute contraindication. Yes, we, uh, we are supposed to distract when we are nodding. Yes, that's correct. The absolute contraindication for manipulation is no diagnosis, no hypothesis. If you don't know what it is, if you don't know what it is, please don't manipulate. I repeat, if you don't know what it is, please don't manipulate. It's not a hit and trial because if you manipulate without knowing, your patient's pain can increase. So number one absolute contraindication of manipulation is no diagnosis, no hypothesis. You don't know what is going on. If the patient has asked you for manipulation, please don't do it if you don't know what it is. Okay. I know people come to you just by watching a social media video and they want uh, to be manipulated. Please don't do it. They can be unstable. They can be having some contraindication. And if the pain increases, that's not going to be good for you. All right. So I'm not going to go into detail of all the contraindications. We generally cover that in our uh, full manipulation course in our cohort program. Okay. So, but please make sure if you are doing a cervical thoracic or thoracic spine manipulation, you need to clear out all the contraindications, please. I saw myself and nobody will be responsible if your patients have pain after the manipulation. So please be responsible and assess your patients completely. Okay. You need to clear out the cervical artery. Okay. Uh, and your patients red flags. Okay. There are evidence that we discussed that. What does the evidence say? I can actually help my patients biceps brachii muscle to increase just by manipulating the cervical spine. You need to know the root values of the nerves. You need to know if the thoracic spine, if your lower trapezius and middle trapezius is not working, which level of the thoracic spine you need to manipulate. If your upper trapezius is tight, why your upper trapezius is tight? Why your uh, hamstring is tight? It's because your primary muscle is not working properly. Why your primary muscle is not working? It is all because of the arthrogenic joint dysfunction. Okay. There, there are a lot of researches which say that the moment you manipulate, you can increase the EMG activity or the strength short term. Okay. This is short term. Yes, you will have to give them the exercises to strengthen that particular muscle. Okay. There are a lot of evidences and that's why we run a certified evidence-based orthopedic manual therapy program. We have a one-year manual therapy program, guys, where it's a US-based program. We have a US experts. Dr. Cameron McDonald will be taking a lecture next uh, month, okay, on the hip part. Uh, so we have American, American experts who take these courses, bring the world best evidence. These are fellows. These are certified therapists, manual therapists, and Dr. McDonald, they were the president of the fellowship residency. Okay. So we have big uh, people who are teaching at the ISOM platform. Okay. 
short term effects of thoracic manipulation on lower trapezium muscle strength cleland 2004 it has been shown that if i manipulate my patient's lower thoracic spine i can increase the muscle strength of the lower trapezius okay cervical thoracic manipulation can increase the knee extension okay i'm going to show you a cervical thoracic manipulation just in a while okay and a lot of articles are there where the manipulations muscle energy techniques can help your patients joint dysfunction yes they have to do the exercises you will have to give some postural recommendation you might give them a ergonomic recommendation that's why i'm not including a lot of ergonomics in this lecture okay i can show you some exercises but i have already taken a free live lecture on the medical exercise prescription okay where i have told it's there on the youtube channel of isomt where i have shown some specific exercises for c7 t1 t1 to t3 so if you want to access that lecture from the youtube you can go through it okay so i'm going to demonstrate to you right now a manipulation technique for cervical thoracic and i like this technique but please make sure that your patients have more than 60 degree of neck rotation your patient should have more than 60 degree of neck rotation when i perform a cervical thoracic manipulation so please can you turn on your stomach man sorry okay so your subject or your patients can be in prone i'm going to take my web space and palpate my patient or the subject's spinous process t1 i take my hand okay so my hands will be like this okay so one hand would be on t1 can i have that spine so my one hand would be on the t1 and the other hand would be on the temple of the head and i'm going to manipulate so i have a spine with me right now if you see if you see the spine okay i'm going to stop this so that you guys can see the back right? so if you see the spine right over there this is my patient's t1 spinous process or the t1 whatever okay what i'm going to do is the patient's head would be rotated to one side i'm going to take my web space on the t1 like that and my other hand on the temple of the head the patient is rotated this way okay this way i'm going to show you the technique of the subject as well so i'm going to take my elbows parallel and opposite and my force would be from my right hand manipulating hand i will never push on the patient's head because that can injure the patient so this technique looks something like this this all right i'm going to show you that in my subject so she's laying down uh, prone comfortably okay i can show you the t1 transverse uh, spinous process i want you to palpate t1 spinous process i would like to palpate her t1 spinous process like that she can turn her head that side okay so i can show you better from this side okay so she has turned her head to the left side this is her left side the camera facing would be the right side i would like to bring her head in a little bit into extension okay that localizes the c7 and t1 for me i will take my web space on her t one spinous process like that and my other hand would be like this okay if you guys can see so my one hand is pushing her obliquely towards the opposite scapula my manipulating hand and this hand would be on the temple of the head okay so the technique would look something like this i'll just take my elbow off so that you guys can see okay the head is in a little rotation and a little bit of an extension okay so i'm going to feel for it or feel for it okay please can you take a deep breath man there we go that was a pop okay if you want me to show it on the other side can you turn your head to one side man all right so she has turned on one side a little bit of an extension okay sorry that i missed it t1 okay i'm sure she's feeling good <laughs> so t1 i palpate on the t1 my one hand on the temple of the head i my manipulating hand is this this is my manipulating hand now if you don't want to manipulate don't manipulate just mobilize guys i said if you are not sure of the hypothesis people can have a lot of restriction you can simply mobilize the cervical thoracic area as well pa you can simply mobilize so this is a very handy manipulation technique one hand on the temple of the head one hand on the t1 
I put the pressure, I put the pressure, and this is my manipulating hand, the direction of force over the opposite scapula. Okay. Would you like? There we go. Already popped. Okay. If you can't do it one time, you can reposition the patient and try performing it the second time as well. Okay. But don't perform more than two times in one single session. I repeat, don't perform more than two times in one single session. Okay. Next, I can show you the presentation. Next, I would like to come on the thoracic manipulation, a very handy technique and patients will complain of thoracic pain, okay? So this is a thoracic spine. I like to do it in a supine position where I use an open grip and put my spinous process around this one. So please can I have the spine? And I like to ask my patients to hug themselves and I would like to push them. This is like a supine AP manipulation. Wait. So what I'm I'm doing over here is I'm putting the patient in a supine position, if you can see. I'm putting the patient in a supine position, okay? Patient is going to hug themselves. I take my metacarpophalangeal line, molar aspect, and put it on the spinous process like this. The patient is going to hug themselves. I am going to provide a little bit of an extension from my lower hand. I would like to manipulate the elbow to that particular segment. And I would like to ask the patient to take a deep breath in. And when they breathe out, pop. Okay, pop. Girls, when you're doing this technique, make sure you can have a pillow or a towel pad around your body so that there is minimal body contact. Or if you want to do it in prone, you can do it in prone as well. But supine works really good and you will require good amount of the angles and training in order to do this technique. And where you can get the training and education, iSOMP is the right platform, okay? Thank you. Please can you lay on your back, ma'am? Okay, come down, come down. Yeah. So let me kind of take it a little bit back, okay? So she's in a crook line position, her knees are bent. Okay, let me kind of first stop this presentation. There we go. Okay. So she's laying down in a supine from line. Please can you hug yourself, ma'am? She hugs herself. Please can you turn towards me? She turns towards me and I'm going to take her middle thoracic, middle thoracic spine right over there, right over there. And I'm going to put my hand like this. She turns back. Now I can manipulate the upper elbow to manipulate that particular segment. So I would like to extend her from my lower hand, okay? I like to extend her from my lower hand and please take a deep breath in, ma'am. Breathe out, okay? She can turn around again. She was assisting a little bit and you can change the level. Like to put her back, okay? Can you lift your bottoms up a little bit? Slightly, slightly. Yeah, a little bit more, a little bit more. Take a deep breath in, breathe out. There we go. She wants to say, yeah. <laughs> All right. So I manipulated her uh, T4, T5 level. Okay. You have to be specific when you do that particular technique. Okay. You want to mobilize in a prone position. You can do that as well, guys. Okay. You can mobilize in a prone position as well. Okay. Next technique, guys, understand you will, I understand I'm going a little fast, but I have to show you the techniques that can be very handy to your patients, especially in a postural issue. They can complain of middle back pain, neck pain, all these techniques would work just great and fabulously, okay? But that doesn't mean that you don't perform them, you don't recommend them any exercises. They have to do the mobility exercises. They have to do the strengthening exercises. They have to work on the ergonomics and their lifestyle changes, okay? It's an amalgamation of all the areas, okay? Next can be lower back. Please be careful to rule out all the contraindication before you do the lumbosacral, thoracic, or cervical thoracic, okay? So I will show you the lumbosacral technique, gapping technique. Okay, this is a specific gapping technique. We teach more opening and closing dysfunction in a particularly lumbar spine. Okay, so please can you turn that side, ma'am? 
all right? So if patient is in a sideline position, they can have a pillow under their head, okay? So is it okay if we expose her a little bit? So say for example, if I want to work on her L5 S1, okay? If I want to work on her L5 S1, I would like to keep the lower leg a little flexed, lower leg flexed like this, okay? I would like to feel from the upper leg and put that on her calf like that, if you see the position, okay? If you see the position, I would like to keep a calf like that and the lower leg is flexed, why? Because I want to put the force on the L5 S1. If you want to put the force up higher, you need to keep the lower leg extended, okay? Now I need to lock the upper lumbar spine as well. So my target segment is L5 S1. I like to feel the L4. I would like to take her hand like this and ask her to hold on to my left scapulae. I would like to rotate her until I feel the rotation of my L4 segment. Please relax, don't do it. Let me do it. And now I feel the rotation. I feel the rotation at the L4. I ask her to hold on to the wrist like this. I take my hand from below so that I can put it on my on her rib cage. I stabilize her L5 spinous process down. I take my hand on her iliac crest, okay, like that. And this is my manipulating or mobilizing hand. This is my stabilizing hand, okay? So you can mobilize the patient with a gapping where I'm adducting my arm, where I'm adducting my arm, okay? So I'm mobilizing her like this. I'm mobilizing her like this, okay? I'm mobilizing her like this. Now, if I want to manipulate her at the end range, there you go, okay? That was a quick pop over there if you just heard that, okay? So that's the mobilization. If you want, if you don't want to do the uh, manipulation, don't do it. And don't put too much pressure on the patient's shoulder. And don't put too much pressure over here. It should be comfortable. Mobilize, 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 mobilize. And when you feel you have reached the end range, and then pop, okay? So that is for lumbosacral area L5S1, okay? The next technique is for the sacroiliac joint. Now, I've taken an elaborate course on the pelvis and the sacroiliac joint. Uh, the research says that you cannot actually put a dysfunction or a diagnosis on the sacroiliac joint. And I've talked about this in my, in my course of the pelvis and sacroiliac joint. But there's a way you can manipulate the pelvis and the sacroiliac joint. And how you can do that, I will show you, okay? So let me just adjust my camera a little bit. Okay. Wait, let me just show you something like this. Okay. I have my colleague over here. He will be stabilizing the patient's sacrum. He will be stabilizing the patient's sacrum. So I like to manipulate her right sacroiliac. I like to manipulate her right sacroiliac joint over there. Okay. So I'm going to ask my colleague to stabilize her right eye lap. Okay which is a part of your sacrum, it is called inferior lateral angle, okay? So I want him to stabilize her right isla, and I'm going to stand, if you see my position, I'm going to take her leg into abduction, internal rotation. Abduction, internal rotation, I can move it a little bit back so you guys can see. I'm going to take her into abduction, internal rotation, and I'm going to lean back I'm going to lean back. I'm going to lean back. The patient can hold on to the bed. I'm going to lean back. So the hip is in a little bit of an abduction, a little extension, and internal rotation. So I've internally rotated her hip. I lean back. I lean back. I lean back. And her eye pop. Okay. Now, yes, you can move the bed. The force can be plus minus. But you need to ask the patient to hold on the bed and the stabilization at the isla can be strong. Now, if you don't have a colleague to hold on to the isla, there's another technique that you can do, but I don't prefer it, especially in the opposite genders. I repeat, I, if you don't have any colleague to help and if you have opposite genders, I don't recommend this technique, okay? So how you do that is, if you see my position, okay? I will take her hip into abduction, little extension and internal rotation. 
Now, I would like to stabilize her eye on myself, but I can put her leg in between my legs. I don't recommend this doing in the opposite genders. And I like to stand with my cross leg like this. Okay, so I cross my leg and I put her leg in between my legs. I'll just show you the position like that. Okay, so I'm standing like that. Okay, and I'm going to pull myself back. I'm going to pull myself back. So what I'm doing is I'm going to stabilize her. I'm going to stabilize her isla myself. Okay, I'm going to stabilize her isla myself. I'm going to internally rotate her hip. Hold on to my legs snugly and tightly. Okay, I'm going to hold on to that. Okay, and I'm going to manipulate. I'm going to manipulate. Okay. Again, if you don't have a colleague to stabilize the isla or the sacrum, try doing this technique, but try to be away, especially when doing on the opposite gender. Now, this requires a lot of force, okay? This requires a lot of force, guys, okay? So I've shown you those manipulation techniques. The better way would be to kind of adjust, hold on to it, and pull it, all right? So, guys, buckle up, increase your strength. Thank you, man. Buckle up, increase your strength, and perform these manipulation techniques so that patients really see your hard work and they can give you more financial growth, okay? It's all about the financial growth, okay? I'm gonna share the presentation. I need to breathe. So this was the thoracic manipulation I talked about. This was the lumbosacral gapping that I'm talking about. So you need to be very specific when the patient comes to you with a low back pain, you need to assess first. Always assess the patient first, see their segmental mobility. That will make you a different manual therapist than your fellow uh, people in the area, okay? And that's how you can really help your patient. So assess and do a proper clinical reasoning and then be a responsible person and then manipulate. Just don't manipulate just because of your marketing and people are posting videos on the social media. That's not the right way, okay? Sacroiliac long axis, that is a technique that I've showed you. So one person is stabilizing the patient's right side isla in this case, and I'm holding onto the patient's right leg, abduction, internal rotation, little bit of extension, and I lean back and I pop. I pop the joint, okay? What next? Self-mobilization, home self-mobilization program. Now. You can recommend patients have been sitting at their desktop, uh, sitting postures for like most of, most of the hours of the day. Whether your patient has a disc problem, disc issues, nerve problem, or back problem, you can tell them to lay down on their stomach, maybe on a dining table, making sure that the dining table don't flip over or their bed. Put their leg relaxed and put a pillow under their upper thoracic level and lie down prone for at least two to three minutes or maybe three to five minutes, okay? once or twice a day if you can and then maybe once or twice a week for lifelong okay lifelong why because they are going to work they're not going to stop their work they will be working for like five years 10 years or 15 years so they will be in their sitting posture so tell them the self-mobilization for once or, or twice a week lifelong okay maybe three minutes a day five minutes a day ten minutes a day i'm sure you can take out three minutes a day and just lie down prone after your office work okay you want to increase the hip flexion, you can take a couple of pillows under the stomach, soft pillows, and increase the hip flexion that will take the self-distraction to the upper lumbar level, or it will increase the distraction force, okay? This is called a self-mobilization. Another one is sitting. Now, your patient has been sitting for long. This is called a self-sitting lumbar traction. I'm sure people know the prone one, but this is a new one that I would like to teach that where you can use a thin foam roller. Now, the one that I have over here is a little thicker one, but you can take a thin foam roller. You can carry it with you while you're driving or while you're at your office, or you can just take a couple of towel rolls. You can just take a couple of towel rolls, okay? Put it just distal to your ischial debrosity. I repeat, just put it distal to your ischial debrosity. One pillow can be put behind the back, okay? One pillow can be put behind the back and sit there for at least two minutes, three minutes or five minutes twice a day, okay? A very handy self-distraction sitting technique, okay? 
Okay. <coughs> you can do that technique. You can perform some mobility exercises. You can perform some child pose, some cat and camel for lower back, thoracic mobility. This exercise doesn't need any introduction. Okay. Patients can perform chin tucks or simple nods, or they can do a start with a supine chin tucks or a pressure feedback unit, which is an evidence-based thing. They can progress to chin tucks in sitting, and you can progress it to the resistance. So these are the exercises. Inversion table, you can use for the disc, but there are limited and conflicting evidence for the disc bulges, okay? Prone distraction helps the disc bulges a little bit better, but the distraction decompression as uh, it was shown in the 2021 revised management of the acute and low back pain article. The evidence for distraction on acute or chronic low back pain is conflicting. Okay. You can do some uh, specific cervical thoracic exercises. It's there on one of my free live lecture on the YouTube called medical exercise prescription. If I manipulated C71, if I manipulated C71, how can you retain it over there? How can you retain it? The patient will be going back and they can get stuck. You understand? So I, I tell my patients, I can manipulate you. I can mobilize you. What is the guarantee that it doesn't come back? It will come back. You are going to sit back again in a, in a bad posture. It will come back. So if you don't do the exercises, it's not going to help you much. Okay. Thoracic self-mobilization, thoracic rotation in sitting, standing, or maybe sideline. Okay. Lumbar pelvic rotations in supine. Abdominal bracing, glutes while sitting or standing, foot intrinsic while you're sitting at the time of the day, you are just relaxing your feet, your hips, and those muscles are not working. So sometimes if you see those marks, remember those marks on the dorsum of the hand. If you see those marks, just start working on your intrinsic of the foot. Just start curling your toes. Just start curling your toes. Okay. And then you can further advise them some ergonomic uh, changes to the desk stations, maybe the armrest. And a few, some chairs are there. I'm not going to go into detail of the ergonomic thing. Okay. The first cervical MET is for your suboccipital headaches or the upper cervical neck pain. All right. Okay, dogs. That was a bang on uh, time. So that marks the end of my lecture today, guys. I know it was short, sweet, concise. Uh, sweet, I don't know, but <laughs> short and concise. And in one hour, I understand it was a little too much in a short span of time. But I want you to take home uh, some of the handy techniques. Remember, your good posture is your next posture. Just remember that. Your good posture is your next posture. Okay? We have a one-year cohort manotherapy program coming up very soon. The applications are currently open. Okay? You get five U.S.-based certificates, international certificates, in just one year of manual therapy program and this is our faculty right now uh you can see that on our website as well okay the deadline is 5th of november okay so we do these lecture you have a certificate of certified evidence-based orthopedic manual therapist people who are doing hands-on they get a diplomat you also get a dry needling practitioner level one certificate you get a spinal manipulative therapist certificate you get a certified extremity manipulative therapist certificate the information is there on our website and our social media, and this will be shared in the group as well. So in India, we do it in right now in Delhi and CR. We do it in Chennai in the southern part. Okay, we are coming to Chennai next month, guys. We do it in Mumbai and we do it in Kolkata too. Okay, so we are doing it in different cities. You're welcome to sign up for this one year manual therapy program hands on. And if you want to contact our Team, you can WhatsApp us on this particular number or email us. Okay. Now we are going to share the quiz on the group. Okay. People who successfully pass the quiz with five out of 10 or more, they will get the certificates. If you want the recording of this lecture, you are welcome to go on our website and become an ISOM premium member. Remember, your good posture is your next posture. All right. So, Follow uh, ISOM on different social media if you can, and follow the ISOM channel uh, where you can get all the updates. And if you have any questions and concerns, please let us know on our contact details. I'm Dr. Parijat Kumar, the co-founder of ISOM. 
and I bring you these free live lectures from our American experts as well to help you to help your patients better in an evidence-based and an ethical way. All right. Please take care. Have a good night. I hope to see you soon and God bless. Thank you.